So, good evening, everybody. My name is Sean Rowland. I will be your the streamer covering this topic. It's a very important topic, so it's very key that you gra understand and grasp this, because it will definitely appear on your AP test. It might be an essay, it could be a short answer, a few multiple choice. It might be all of them. Well, probably not all of them. It might be like two of them. Maybe one. But you really got to know it. So let's get into this. So are you going to... Okay, you're familiar with the Missouri Compromise. Good. So what? It, explain what it is. Like, What does it do? Why is it important? You can just sit in the chat if you explain it. That would be really beneficial. Yeah, you are right. So it's basically that I'll define it. You're ninety-five percent right. It's a very good explanation. So it's basically Missouri cannot Missouri can enter the union as a slave state. I'm a, uh, as a slave state, right? So they can enter the union as a slave state, right? But any state, any state above the thirty six thirty line. Cannot have slavery. In any state, you know, below it can, they can choose. But any state above it can't. And the person that's been very, the person that comes up with this is, you You probably have heard of him, Henry Clay. He'll come up again later when we do the Compromise of 1850. He is the king of compromising. That's when you think Henry Clay, you need to think compromise. So then, okay, so now we can. Oh, right, now we can begin talking about these right sectional and regional differences. Obviously, slavery is a big deal. So let's start by defining this term. Popular sovereignty. As it refers to slavery and slaves, the battle for free and slave states. So it's basically that states should be able to decide whether or not they should allow slavery. So it's not about like lines, like geographical differences. It's about what do the people in the states want? Do they want slavery? So the issue, and this is why I asked, you, asked about the Missouri Compromise, is, is the issue is that theoretically, theoretically, it could violate the Missouri Compromise. Does this make does it make sense since states can decide whether or not they become a state or not? It could violate if a state above the line decides that they want slavery. So when this is championed, this whole idea of popular sovereignty is championed by... Stephen Douglas of Illinois. Right, he's very 
important. You might recognize him from the. Oh, okay. I'm gonna post this as a question, and I'm gonna answer. Start answering. Okay, so the popular sovereignty, the idea of popular sovereignty, sovereignty was created by Stephen Douglas, a senator from Illinois, and he is well known mainly for his Lincoln Douglas debates. And you'll see this idea in the Kansas Nebraska Act, which says that they can Kansas and Nebraska can decide whether or not they want slavery. If that helps answer your question. Good. So what? Okay. So now that we've got that out of the way, that'll come in handy later. Let's talk about. California. So if you remember Polk, well, the main things you'll see with these sectional tensions, a lot of them are over land, because you know, America's manifest destiny and their way all across the American continent, because they want the land. Ah, why was it established? We'll get into that later, but that's a really good question. Where is it? Post as a question. I definitely want to answer this later, but I can do it now, if that helps. Okay. That, because that's the, there is, okay, so let's get into California. One of my, this is the most bizarre, you'll see why it's bizarre. So California wants to enter, they want to enter the union as a free state. The issue with this is that it would, the pro- issue is that it would upset the balance of free and slave states. So there'd be one more free state than slave state. So they end up agreeing that California has to send one pro slavery senator and one anti slavery senator, which doesn't really make sense if you think about it. Like, why? They're a free state. They obviously don't want to send a slavery senator, but you can't, they can't upset the balance of power between slaves and free states as shown in the Missouri Compromise because a part that I forgot to mention, so Missouri can enter as a slave state as long as another state enters as a free state. So they carve out the northern part of Massachusetts and make it Vermont, and that makes it okay for there to be a free state or for Missouri to enter as a slave state. Is the, I have a question. Is the mind map helping make these things sense, making sense, helping you understand? Or would you prefer if I just lecture? Or you have no preference. Okay, the mind map is helping. So I will keep updating it. Free state. So let's talk about, so we'll talk about multiple elections. So I'll make a whole branch for elections. So we're going to talk about the election of 1848. 
And we have a new political party called the Free Soil Party. And they are particularly against slavery. Well, not they're 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 not like abolitionists. Like slavery is morally bad. They're more like slavery hurts white workers. Is basically their message. Okay, so they don't want slavery to expand further west. You'll see this is a common thing with certain, like Abraham Lincoln, for example, doesn't want slavery to go further west. But the free, not saying that Lincoln was part of the Free Style Party, but they basically don't want slavery to expand to the west because it would hurt white free white laborers or even paid white laborers. It would hurt them if slavery was in the, the West. Exactly. So white, they believe and they preach that white landowners would lose, or white, well, free, like, whites would lose their jobs because of slaves out West. Because there's not a lot of farmland out West, so they would lose their job. Do they ridicule slavery for this? So in that election, there's Zachary, Zachary Taylor of the Whig Party beats Lewis Cass of the Democrats and Martin Van Buren of the Free Soil Party. I'm just cleaning this up a little. Okay. I I'm not sure of this, but that's a great question that we can Google together. One was Dred Dr Scott was I don't think so. Google doesn't really help with the question. I'm sorry. Okay. So, so we're going to talk about, no, no worries at all. I can prove, I get confused with people names sometimes, that I'm not the best with remembering names. 
I normally remember them on the time period. We're going to get into another compromise. Compromise of 1850. So the U.S. during the, in this time was on the verge of disunion and war. So, you know, Zachary Taylor was just elected. Right? And in 1850, he dies in office. And Milliard Fillmore becomes president. He seeks a quick solution to this issue. So Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun, and I don't remember the other guy's first name, something Webster, they propose a compromise. And the agreement is California can enter as a free state. State upsets the balance, right? We talked about this. Yeah, Daniel Webster. They upset, it upsets the balance of power that they enter as a free state. So they have to send a free slave and an anti-slave representative. Slave trade is abolished in D.C. Territories of New Mexico and Utah are organized under popular sovereignty so they get to pick whether or not they want slavery. They enter as, a free, as free states. And a new fugitive slave law is passed. Okay, so I'm going to update the slides. We still have all. Is there a So this, I'm going to upload it. I think repetition is key, so I think it helps if I upload it after I explain because the more you look at something the better it helps you They're from the car, right? We talked about it. And two, we have the slave trade abolished in DC. And then we have finally a new fugitive slave law. Oh, we got okay, so let's talk about this new fugitive soy law that comes about. It's the basically the only reason why the South accepts it, because it's a very strict slave law. When I say strict, I mean Jesus. Oh, that's a good. One. 
Yes. The whole, well, the future of Soiwa was to have Soibs get recaptured. Yes. The whole purpose of it was to, if a slave was to escape, was to get the slave back to its owner. Because it's such a bad thing to say, but it's, it is true at the time. Slaves were property, or they're considered property. So you don't want to, it's basically like your property running away from you. So you want back what is yours. If that makes sense at all. So the slave law requires all U.S. citizens to assist in the return of slaves, whether you're in a free state and reside in a free state or not. And slave owners can reclaim runaways simply by swearing it's that it's theirs. So I could just be like, "Yo, that's my slave." And they give it, theoretically give it to me. African Americans are not entitled to a jury trial and cannot testify in court. Federal magistrates receive $10 for a case that returned it a fugitive slave in five in which they were detained but not re-enslaved. So they want to re-enslave them. Citizens who are aiding these slaves, even in northern states or free soil states, can be jailed for six months and fined up to 200. Wait, let me make sure. I think it's 20. That's no, $2,000. Yeah, it's harsh. That's why the South likes it. It's harsh. They're willing to give up the slave trade in D.C. and when California enter upsetting the balance because they get this. U.S. Marshals who refuse to arrest and detain slaves, even on free soil, you see wherever, get can get fined up to a thousand dollars and will be dismissed opposition to this act was violent in the north in some cases in new york and boston riots broke out and detained fugitives were freed from their prison prison bringing the horrors and injustice of slavery to the doorsteps of northerners actually created more abolitionists than captured runaway slaves so the whole thing about this is that in this harshness, it does, they kind of don't, they make more abolitionists, they make more enemies of the slave system and more skeptics. If it is fun with you guys, would I be able to stop updating this? Because we still have a lot to get through. And I think it would be more beneficial to help if I didn't. Okay. Because I think it would be better to cover more than less. Okay. It, it definitely would be shut down when he can become president because most of the slaves, when he becomes president and the Emancipation Proclamation, not when he becomes president, when he delivers the Emancipation Proclamation, would be freed. The only ones that weren't were the ones in the Union, states that were in the Union. So that would be states that never seceded, that had slavery. 
Okay, right, so now we can talk about books. Who doesn't like books? Am I right? Is it, are you are you guys at, are any of you guys avid readers? Or are you kind of like me? Sometimes hate reading, sometimes don't. Uh, so we have a very influential book called Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. She was an evangelical crusader of the Second Great Awakening. Wrote, she writes it as a protest to the fugitive slave law and to vividly portray the horrors of slavery to Northerners. It inspired many Northerners to fight in the Civil War. She went out of her way, however, to not vilify the South. She doesn't want to make them the enemy. She just wants to be like, what they're doing is wrong. It sells 30,000 copies in its first nine months. Two million copies by the end of the 18... Oh, no, 300,000 copies in the first nine months. Two million copies by the end of the 1850s and was translated into 20 different languages. It has international appeal. Brits and French and the French don't interfere on behalf of the South, in part because of Tom mania amongst their people. Abraham Lincoln credited Miss Stowe, you know, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, as being the little woman who wrote the book, that made the Great War. Uh, what article are you referring to? Oh, I did write it. There are my notes from last year. Because there's a, it's a very dense topic, so I remember most of it but not all of it so i like to use it as like a guide because i don't remember everything which is kind of bad but i did this a year ago so i don't remember everything so it helped So we also have something, a book called The Impending Crisis of the South by Hinton or Helper. And it's a non-aristocratic, written by a non-aristocratic white from North Carolina. And she said, non-slaveholding whites suffer the most from slavery, which, would ma- which makes sense because you see... Slave, most whites don't own slaves, and the southern's economy, the South's economy was agrarian. So agrarian economies aren't like and slaves and people that don't own slaves. It doesn't really mix well, so they're really hurtful. And it shows a strong class division that exists in the South. So if you think about Southern society, not a lot of them own slaves. And it's used by a political campaign tool by early Republicans to you know, help fight the cause against slavery. In the election of 18... Now we have another... The election of 1852, Franklin Pierce, a Democrat, beats Winfield Scott, who's a Whig. And the effects is... Well, not really effects... But Pierce, well, there is a one effect, the weakening of the Whig Party. Pierce is a northerner from New England, and he has southern appeal. So he kind of appeals to everyone, but also not to everyone. He so, so, sought to end slavery's borders and restore equal balance in Congress. So he offers Spain $120 million for Cuba. You know, reasonable Cuba. They're they're a main main sugar production region. So you know, slavery. They like slavery. They use slaves, or they could there. So it could make sense as a slave state. 
Oh, what is Bleeding Kansas? I will save that. We, I definitely do want to talk about that. We're getting to that point. I kind of want to skip around to thing. If we run out of time to the key thing. So y'all still manifesto is basically they want to purchase Cuba. The Gat and there's a thing, the Gadson purchase in 1853. And it's newly acquired territories in the West were disconnected. So there's need for a railroad. And then the issue is should it cut through the north or the south? Pierce favors the south. Southern track is easier to build because the mountains aren't as high. It would, and it would not have to pass through unorganized territory. So they purchased Arizona and southwestern New Mexico for $10 million to complete this project. Because, you know, they need the land. So let's talk about, oh, now we can go into the Kansas-Nebraska Act. So let's, I'll start by answering, but why was the Kansas-Nebraska Act established? So the main reason it's established is to, because it's kind of a, yeah, we'll let the people decide issue. So it does, it appeals to the north to the Southern Democrats, and it appeals to the Southerners, and it appeals to the North. It has mixed appeal because people want, they they support letting the states decide because if the state wants slavery, they should have it. If the state doesn't, it doesn't. So the... Well, so you, if you remember Stephen Douglas, the king, or not the king, the proclaimer of popular sovereignty, he proposes the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which would allow Kansas and Nebraska to decide on their statehood, whether, like, not their statehood, but whether they should be a free or slave state. Yeah, he favors, it favors westward expansion. Oh, this is about Stephen Douglas. He favors westward expansion, so he calls for the settlement of western prairies and construction of a railroad from Chicago to the Pacific. So the construction of a transcontinental railroad required Congress to organize the western lands into territory. You know, the whole reason we got into the whole slavery issue is with the addition of new territories. So it's not the best idea to end the conflict or to add more states into the mix, I guess. This is the better phrasing. So the issue of popular sovereignty we talked about earlier is it could theoretically violate the Missouri Compromise. In northern, so the, oh, this is a perfect time to start talking about Bleeding Kansas. Kansas. So Bleeding Kansas is basically where a whole bunch of people that support slavery from, what state is it? One of the slave states. I don't remember which one. And a whole bunch of free state citizens all enter Kansas to try and vote and sway the vote to their favor. So there's a whole bunch of blood and violence and stuff. So it's basically like America. So that's why historians call it the start of the Civil War because there's the whole issue of, right, because of the whole thing. So it's the start of fighting over sexual sex, sectional tensions. Okay. So let's talk about John Brown. He's an abolitionist from Ohio. He goes to Kansas in 1856, hatches a plan to invade the South, calls upon the slaves to rhyme, rise up. He arms them and then establishes a black haven. So in 1959, he launches a raid on Harper's Ferry. 
He kills several innocent people. The slaves don't rise up because they're not aware of his plan. So he's captured by Colonel Robert E. Lee and tried and hanged to death. Uh, John, yeah. So John Brown, he's an abolitionist from Ohio. And he is, again, yeah. He is the one who killed an arsenal. Yes. So, so what are the effects of the raid of Harper on Harper's Ferry? So it increases the call for Southern secession. The and it strengthens Southern paranoia about the North and the abolitionist movement. Brown becomes a martyr, worth more dead than alive. So let's talk about the Bully Brooks incident. No, no worries at all. I am here to help you succeed. So longtime Massachusetts Senator Charles Summer delivers a speech called The Crime Against Kansas. Yeah, he basically... So in this speech, Summers blasts Southerners as hirelings picked from drunken spew of vomit of an uneasy civilization. She's basically calling them, in simple terms, scum of the earth. So South Carolina Senator Preston Brooks responds by beating Summer with an 11-ounce cane until it broke. This causes serious damage to Summer, and it shows how passionate these issues were prior to the Civil War. Yeah. You see, this is how serious it becomes. Like, Bleeding Kansas shows it, the Boy Brooks incident. These all show the escalation of slavery leading to violence, and by, which ultimately leads to the Civil War. We're not quite to Lincoln yet. We will be soon because. We're one, I think we're one president away. We're to the election of 1856 with James Buchanan, a Democrat. He's a Pennsylvania, from Pennsylvania and is a lawyer. He has great political service experience, not service experience. He served as the foreign minister of London. He's virtually silent on the issue of slavery because he does not want to increase tensions. He favors popular sovereignty, because, you know, it's a popular issue. He's the first ever president to, that's a bachelor. And we also have John C. Fremont running against him. Obviously, James C. Cannon becomes president. And he's the first ever Republican candidate. He's against the extension of slavery to the territories and achieves a strong result in a loss. And then Milliard Fillmore, he's from the Know Nothing Party. He runs as a third-party candidate on a platform of anti-foreignism. He is against immigration. And then we have the very important, crucial Dred Scott case, Dred Scott v. Stanford. And it, Dred Scott sues for his freedom based on his long residence in Free Stoyle. He lived five years in Illinois and Wisconsin. Chief Justice Rather, Roger B. Taney, he's a southerner, rules that Scott was a slave, not a citizen. He can't sue in federal court. So, and Scott, slaves are private property. They could be taken into any territory and held in bondage legally. So basically, you you could take your slave up north, and they're still your slave, even though they're on free land. And this is protected by the Fifth Amendment, which forbids Congress to deprive people of their personal property without due process. This is why it's okay 
for them to do this. The Missouri Compromise is unconstitutional because Congress had no power to ba- ban slavery in territories where there were not yet states. When there were not yet states, makes this ruling even though the Missouri Compromise had already been repealed by the Kansas-Nebraska Act. So the effects of this heightened sen- sexual no, s- sectional tensions between the North and the South. There's a lot of conflict. So it further splits the Democratic Party on sectional lines. If that makes sense. So then there is Ab- the emergence of Abraham Lincoln. And it came from, he came, comes from unimpressive roots. He runs in 1858 for election in Illinois. He runs against a well-respected and well-known incumbent Stephen Douglas. So there's these Lincoln to Douglas debates from August to October. The key issue is Lincoln challenges Douglas on the Freeport Doctrine, which states slavery wouldn't be permitted in a territory where the people voted it down, regardless of what the Supreme Court ruled. The Court of Public Opinion, Popular Sovereignty, was on Douglas' side. and result, Douglas wins debates and the election his defiance to the Supreme Court and ardent support of popular sovereignty made him a non-factor nationally when the Democrats split, because he has little support in the South. Lincoln makes great roads in the Republican Party and hearts and minds of the North. So with the election of 1850, twice the second time where the Northern and Southern Democrats cannot agree. Southerners do not accept Douglas the Southern Democrats nominate John C. Beckenridge of Kentucky. His platform is to extend slavery into the territories and annex Cuba as a slave haven. Now we have the Constitutional Union Party, formed by a former Whigs and Know Nothings, and they saw John Bill of Tennessee to be their candidate. So the Republicans nominate in this election Abraham Lincoln. He has few political enemies. His whole platform is, do not extend slavery into the territory. This appeals to the free soil, high, a high protective tariff, appeal to northern manufacturers, and is a guarantee of all immigrant rights, a Pacific Railroad, which appeals to Westerners, and free homesteads from public domain. And this appeals to farmers. So it kind of appeals to everyone but the South. Southerners identify Lincoln as an avid abolitionist. He's not. And they view his possible victory as a guarantee of secession. So obviously Lincoln wins. He's very sectional. 60% of the voters don't vote for him. He wasn't on the ballot in 10 states. South still controls Supreme Court justices, the House, and the Senate. And the federal government couldn't touch slavery where it existed. So they're not, they don't really have to worry about the slavery in their states. They have to worry about the expansion of it, if that makes sense. So four days after Lincoln's elected, South Carolina secedes from the Union. In the next six weeks, six more states follow. Alabama, Mississippi, for oh, it doesn't really matter. So then the seven states are the Confederate states, and they elect Jefferson Davis to be their president. And James Buchanan basically is like, yeah, okay. And does nothing. And that's all there is to know about sectional tensions. Have a great night, everybody.